will, have, will be about will be about conformal field theory techniques to attack scattering amplitudes in theories of gravity or string theory more generally. And uh, as you will see, it's building on the two first lectures that we have had, and this is one of the applications of all the techniques that we were discussing. And this is based on a uh, joint work with Daniel Savisi and Eric Permuter. And please, uh, stop me at any time, ask me any questions. So I am trying to do this very pedagogical as well. I won't uh, attack you. Now, scattering amplitudes are very important observables in any quantum field theory. They are basically, the four-point amplitude is the probability that two particles with momenta P1 and P2 scatter into two other particles of momenta P3 and P4. <laughs> and, um, and in general, it is a complicated piece to compute. So it can depend on many things. It depends on which particles you are scattering, the masses, the charges of the particles, etc. If you have a theory with coupling constants, number of colors n, it also will depend on the parameters of your theory, and it depends on the momenta of the particles being scattered through the famous Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U, which are defined like this. And um, we should care about the scattering amplitudes, even if we do a string theory or mathematics, because they are the ones that allow to test your theory. Right? So you produce some scattering amplitudes, you go and do an experiment, and you may have to throw your theory, and there is nothing you can do about that. More abstractly, it turns out that the scattering amplitudes can teach us a lot about the symmetries of a theory and the properties of a theory. And many properties that may not be at all obvious just from looking at the Lagrangian of your theory, once you compute the scattering amplitudes, it, you will start seeing a lot of beauty in this. And over the last years, we have seen relations between scattering amplitudes and, it has been mentioned today, Wilson loops, volumes of polytopes, this thing of the Grassmannian, etc., etc., etc. So there has been a lot of advance on these things, and I am not going to talk about this, but uh, it's interesting. A theory that we would like to understand is the theory of general relativity. If, uh, if you have just pure gravity, pure gravity is given by the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian, given by this, and then in that theory you can consider the scattering of gravitons. And uh, for the scattering of gravitons, what you do, you say that your metric is almost flat with a very small perturbation, given by this h over there, and then you write an action for the graviton field, let's say, and then you just consider Feynman diagrams. So you are trying to do a quantum field theory of gravity. And if you do that, it turns out, for instance, that the scattering of four gravitons is ultraviolet divergent at one loop, and that's not too bad, because you can reabsorb that divergence, but at two loops, you cannot do that. And the theory is non-renormalizable. And vaguely, what is happening, so this divergence is a ultraviolet divergence, and it comes when the two gravitons get really close to each other. So it's a deep divergence that comes because of um, uh, the gravitons are point-wise, they come very close. And so one of the alternatives to get something finite is the proposal of a string theory. In a string theory, we are replacing gravitons by some close strings of finite length, a square root of alpha prime. And here, you see, so these two points, uh, so, so this and this, get really close to each other. But if you replace the gravitons by strings, then this doesn't happen anymore. And uh, you can see it in different ways, why this regularizes the, the computation. But basically, a string theory provides a sort of cutoff, where you, if you have a propagator 1 over p squared, you add this exponential damping term, and integrals don't diverge anymore for finite alpha prime. On the other hand, you see that if you are considering low energies, so a process in which the energies of the process are small, like p squared, much smaller than 1 over alpha prime, or the limit in which these strings are like pointwise, depending on your, on your process, then you should recover general relativity. 
or in some supersymmetric versions of the string theory, you will recover supergravity. Um, and the view we have now is that we believe that general relativity, we have to see it as an effective field theory, and we have a, the starting point, that is the einstein hilbert lagrangian and then we have a correction, a tower of corrections, a string theory corrections, like this term, this term, and so on, in such a way that each correction, higher derivative corrections, are suppressed by powers of this alpha prime. So, um, as the energies become stronger and stronger, or these terms become more and more relevant, and we say that the string theory provides a UV completion of general relativity. Is that okay? Good. So the cool thing, if you want to understand general relativity, is not to study amplitudes in general relativity, but is to study amplitudes in string theory. String theory is a very simple uh, theory, actually. It has only two parameters. So we have one parameter, which is the square root of alpha prime, which is the size of these strings. And then there is another parameter, which is the string coupling constant, which is the probability that one string splits into two other strings, or vice versa, that two strings joint into, into a third. And what we would like to do, we would like to compute the scattering, in particular the four-point scattering, of, um, of string states. And this, of course, then this amplitude will depend on the three Mandelstam variables, P1, P2, P3, P4, or SDU, here, and it will depend on the string coupling constant and on alpha prime. Any questions so far? Good. So this is like a string theory 101. Now, in a string theory, we have something uh, quite nice, quite neat, and it's the fact that the computation organizes in a genus expansion. So you can consider worksheets if you have two close strings that go into two other close strings, you can uh, organize the computation in worksheets of genus 0, genus 1, genus 2, etc. And it turns out that each of these contributions comes with a corresponding power of gs squared. So this comes with gs to the 0, gs squared, gs to the 4, etc., etc. Um, already in the old times of, of a string theory, so this is one of the first things that has been done actually, um, the, the amplitude for four, uh, well, gravitons or, or massless states, etc., at genus zero and in flat space, this quantity here was computed, and this is given by the uh, Vira Soro Shapiro amplitude. So it is a beautiful expression completely symmetric in these three Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U, and which is some function of alpha prime. So, the idea is that if you are at three level, so you have this genus zero, and in flat space, you know what the expression is. And the expression is quite nice. Is that okay? So, we have known this for some time. Now, the problem with the string theory is that even in flat space, higher genus terms are a pain in the neck. They are notoriously difficult to compute. For instance, if you have the next one, which is just this genus 1 with four insertions, which is equivalent to a torus with four insertions, the expression is incredibly complicated. So it is given by some integral on the fundamental region of the torus, of this modular function, which is itself an integral over ratio of these theta functions that you may have heard about, but they are extremely complicated functions. So, already the genus 1 computation in flat space is a monster. So people have worked with it, you can expand it in powers of alpha prime, we will come back later to this, but this is, uh, is quite hard. And Another problem is that for curved space-time, imagine that you are not in flat space, you are in curved space-time, and you would like to consider a string theory in another space, we have no idea how to do this. There is no, we don't know what is the prescription 
to compute this in principle. Even in principle, you don't know what integral to write down. So here you need the expression for the vertex operators, and these vertex operators, even for the graviton states, they are not known in curved space time. Now, in this talk, and suggested by my previous two lectures, what we will do, we will use a completely alternative approach, and we will try to compute this quantity, basically this quantity, in curved space time. Is that okay? Now, any questions about the motivation and the plan? I won't. I, 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 in that expression, you mean the new as complex variables that we really need to know one, two, and two. And, 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 yeah, so absolutely. So new one, new two, new three, new four are complex variables, and they are the insertion point of these four vertex operators, and you need to integrate that on the torus, and then you define this function, and then this function you integrate again over the torus. Yes? Now, our alternative approach, again, will be this ADS-CFT duality that you have heard about several times. As we have seen repeated times, uh, this duality relates a string theory on ADS-5 cross F5 to a quantum field theory living, living in the four-dimensional boundary of ADS-5. And as you have seen, the, the theory here is this theory N equals 4 super conformal Mills with SUN gauge group and is the most, is the most symmetric gauge theory uh, without gravity that you can have in four dimensions. Now, on the string theory side, so again, this dictionary was reviewed before, but let me repeat this. On the string theory side, you have two parameters. You have the string coupling constant GS, and also you have the radius of the ADS, which is the same as the radius of the sphere, in string units. And on the right-hand side, you have the Jan Mills coupling constant and N, the, the rank of the gauge group. And Maldacena provided us with a very neat dictionary between these two things. And the, what is important for us is that the string coupling constant behaves like 1 over n, goes like 1 over n, and r squared over alpha prime goes like uh, is the square root of lambda. So this is just the ADS-CFT dictionary. Let's try to make the dictionary um, a little bit more precise. Now, imagine that you want to compute an a an a string a scattering amplitude on ADS 5 plus S5. That doesn't seem very hard to compute. And there is a conceptual problem with that. Because this is, is like a box. And in a box, you cannot have asymptotic states. So what ADS CFT duality tells us is that if you want to compute this, these string amplitudes on ADS 5 plus S5 are dual through the ADS-CFT duality to some correlator of local operators in the boundary. So, what we will try to, to I will add this much better later on, but, um, but basically we have this map where the amplitude in ADS-5 plus S5 as a function of GS, alpha prime over R, etc., is equivalent to this four-point correlator, and I will be more precise now in which correlator I am studying and in which regime of n equals four superiorities. Is that okay? Good. Now, uh, from the dictionary that we just discussed, remember that the genus expansion on a string theory was proportional to GS here. So through the ads dictionary, it turns out that the genus expansion corresponds to a 1 over n expansion. That's the expansion that we need to consider. And furthermore, stringy corrections to supergravity corresponds to 1 over lambda corrections in n equals 4 superionic mills. We have already seen that in, in some other lectures as well. Now, what we would like to scatter is the graviton of ADS. We would like to consider a scattering of gravitons. You may remember that we were told that the graviton, let's say h mu nu or g mu nu, maps to the stress tensor 
of n equals 4 superior meals. Now, in n equals 4 superior meals, the stress tensor corresponds, belongs to a multiplet, to the stress tensor multiplet, and the primary of this stress tensor multiplet, the superconformal primary, is a scalar operator of protected dimension 2. Um, so this 2, O2, is a scalar operator, is a protected scalar of dimension 2 in the stress tensor multiplet. And this is the correlator that we will study. Now, if I have time, uh, I will try to show why we need to consider also um, other kind of operators, which are called the OP, protected operators of, of dimension P. And what they map to, they map to Calusa claim modes of the graviton as you compactify on this S5. Is that okay? Good. So, if we want to compute a string amplitude on any S5 cross S5 in a genus expansion and in a low energy expansion, what we need to compute in n equals 4 super n mills is this correlator, O2, 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 because that's what corresponds to the graviton, in a 1 over n and in a 1 over lambda expansion. This computation, a couple of years ago, would have made you cry, because it's really hard. It's, we have no technology to, to go 1 over n too much in n equals 4 super n mills. But this has been recently uh, made possible thanks to the analytic booster. And basically now, I will show you, so the plan now of, of the next two-thirds of the talk will be first, we will accommodate what we have learned in the first two lectures in order to solve this problem, and then we will go back to the strings on ADS5 versus 5 and try to write down or see an amplitude. Is that okay? And uh, yeah, uh, we will work to order 1 over n to the 4, but you know, it's quite good. Uh, and that corresponds to genus 1 for, from the string amplitude. Any questions at this point? So Good. When you're working yes. the 1 over lambda expansion, is, that would correspond to semi-classical somehow. Right. So, the so, side, right? Yeah, so what we are going to do, you will see, we are going to do a 1 over n expansion. And then at each order in 1 over n, you can do a 1 over lambda expansion. And we will understand what is the structure of this to any arbitrary order in 1 over lambda. So we will work to all orders, but not to finite lambda. That would be too hard, and I don't know how to do that. But I will tell you what the structure is, even to 1 over lambda to the 55. I can tell you what the structure is. And, and then you guess the Verasaurus appear one or from that, or is there? No, everybody asks me that question. That's very hard. And I will tell you why I cannot do that. And that would be beautiful. Yes, and I would be, yeah, anyway. Yes, no, unfortunately. But we will go back. Good. So now, let's, uh, so let's review. So we will, we will review in the next 10, 15 minutes all what we have said in the first two talks. But I want to, to, to look um, at this problem in particular. So we have seen, we have studied conformal field theories, and we have seen that they are theories invariant under conformal transformations. And we have seen that the main ingredient are conformal primary local operators. And these conformal primary local operators, there were operators O evaluated at a point X, because they are local, and they were labeled by their dimension delta, which is the eigenvalue with respect to the dilatation operator, and Lorentz spin L. And uh, furthermore, for a given conformal primary, then you have all a tower of descendants that were given by derivatives acting on that conformal primary. Then we have seen that a very cool property of conformal field theories is that if you take two of the guys, and you or girls, I mean, they are just operators. And you put them together, you can express them as an infinite sum of local operators on the, on the right. Now, these local operators will involve both primaries and descendants, but the important point is that the coefficients of all the descendants are fixed 
in terms of the coefficients of the primary. And this introduces the OPE coefficients Cijk for any triplet of primaries, and these OPE coefficients, together with the dimensions, scaling dimensions of the operators, characterize the conformal field theory, and is what we denoted the CFT data. Is that okay? Then, um, do you find students useful this summary? Are you getting bored? Yeah, a little bit maybe, but okay. You cannot tell it. Um, then we have seen that the main observable are correlation functions of these local operators. And uh, we have seen that once you tell me what the dimensions of primary operators are, these fixed, the two-point functions, and if you give me also the OP coefficients, then we can also fix the three-point functions. And the dynamically non-trivial, the first, the simplest dynamically non-trivial quantity, is the four-point function of four identical scalar operators, and uh, crossing symmetry, conformal symmetry, doesn't fix that uniquely, but it tells us that is an arbitrary function of the cross ratios, u and v, divided this prefactor. And let me, um, let me put expressions for the cross ratios here. So u is x12 squared, um, x34. square over x13 square x24 square and v is equal to x14 square x23 square divided x13 square x24 square good and then we also uh, add well, I told you, so we saw that this four-point function satisfies two very beautiful properties. The first beautiful property is that it admits crossing symmetry. So if you reshuffle one with three, if you exchange them, this implies certain symmetry in the four-point function. There is another symmetry that I didn't talk to you about because it's not very useful, but you can also exchange one and four and this also gives you a relation between uh, g u b and g u over b, 1 over b. So you have these, these symmetries. And in addition to these symmetries, we have seen that if you take the four-point function and you take the first two operators and do the OPE of them, and the same with the last two, then you could express this four-point function as an infinite sum over conformal blocks. and uh, so GUV is an infinite sum over the intermediate operators, where the intermediate operators are the operators appearing in the OP of O with O. And we have this square OP coefficients with the conformal blocks. Is that OK? And uh, of course, in general, this is a very complicated problem. And as, as we said before, in general, you don't know the spectrum, so you don't know what the sum runs over, and also you don't know the OP coefficients. So you are pretty much uh, in bad shape. Then we have seen that if you combine these two things, if you combine crossing with the conformal block decomposition, you arrive to this beautiful equation, which is the conformal bootstrap equation. And we have also argued that this equation is as beautiful as it's useless because it is quite hard to work with it. Because the left hand side is easy to expand around u equals 0 and v equals 1, but the right hand side is easy to expand around u equals 1 and v equals 0. So there is no regime in which both sides are easy. Is that okay? Good. So let me tell you now any questions. So this was uh, maybe a quick review of the things that we have seen. I thought it was useful, but uh, is that okay? Do you have any questions? Don't, don't be afraid. Yeah? Good. So now people started to uh, have different tastes, and, and everything is all right, and that's nice. And so there are two kinds of, uh, of studies that one can do in this equation. 
And basically, the idea is that you can study this equation in different regions. And in order to denote the different regions, it is convenient to introduce these cross ratios, set and set bar. So u is set set bar, <coughs> and v is 1 minus set, 1 minus set bar. Now, if you are in Euclidean space time, then in that regime, set bar is the complex conjugate of set. And in that case, you can study crossing around this symmetric point, u, v equals 1 quarter. And basically, to study these equations numerically around that point, this red point, is the starting point for the numerical booster. You can do something else. Now, in the Lorentzian regime, set and set bar, they are independent real variables. And then you have the possibility of considering u and v both going close to zero. Notice that here you could take set very small and set bar very close to one. But of course, if set and set bar are complex conjugate of each other, if one is small, the other cannot be close to one. So in order to take this limit in which u and v become simultaneously zero, you need to be in Minkowski space. So you are here. And to study the equation, the bootstrap equation, in that regime is the starting point of the analytic or line cone bootstrap. Is that OK? Let me give you another uh, physical intuition of actually what's going on. And this, I think, is a, nice, uh, is a nice cartoon. So imagine I have two fingers. And I want to make these fingers be very close to each other. If I am in Euclidean space-time, the only thing I can do is to take these two fingers very close to each other. Right? And that's it. However, if we are in Minkowski space-time, I can take one finger to be in the light cone of the other finger. Right? And this is quite nice. Because it means that in a space-time, sorry, in Minkowski space-time, you can have situations in which the square of x to 3 go to 0, but x to 3 doesn't go to 0. And if you have a look at the cross ratios, this means that you can consider a limit in which v goes to 0, because x to 3 is very near 0, but u is still arbitrary. Is that OK? So this you can only do in Minkowski spacetime. And what happens in order to achieve that, what you have to do uh, is you take your operators, the four points of the correlator, and you make some of them not separated from each other, or almost not separated. And uh, it turns out that in this limit, the correlator develops singularities. And these are singularities which are some function of u divided, let's say, v to the alpha, of this 1 over v singularities. And as we have seen in, in these lectures, in the first two lectures, once you know these singularities as v goes to zero, then there exists either large spin perturbation theory or the inversion formula. And from these singularities, you can reconstruct the full correlator. Now, the way I solve this to you is by telling you that once you have these null singularities, uh, you could basically reconstruct all the CFT data, so this double, double discontinuity or, or singularities, you could reconstruct all the OP data, the CFT data. But of course, once you have the full CFT data, you can plug that back into the sum of conformal blocks. So the idea is that the whole correlator can be reconstructed from this singular part of the correlator. Is that OK? This is very similar to what happens in complex analysis. If you have a holomorphic function, and you know the poles and the residues of that function, then you can reconstruct the whole function. And in complex analysis, let's say that I tell you that there is a function with a pole at set equals 1 and residue 3. So you could say, uh -huh, it should be that. But of course, someone else can tell me, well, I can think of another function. I can think of this function too, that, that it doesn't have a pole anywhere. So exactly as in complex analysis, you also have ambiguities. And from the point of view of the bootstrap, these ambiguities 
uh, were related to situations in which we have this delta L0, so only operators with the spin 0 acquire a dimension, and we will we have that too. But this is exactly the same as in complex analysis. You are reconstructing a function from the residues and the poles, and you have some polynomial ambiguities, and, and, uh, but these are very much under control, and we will talk later about it. Is that okay? So this is the equivalent of the inversion formula that you have seen at the end of the last lecture. Any questions? Beautiful. So let's now... Oh my let's now... Maybe one question. Yes. When did this figure from emission can get to um, get this yes. result? You have to do something and assume something. Yes. But the behavior... Yes. Some function yes. some continuity. Yes. Uh, are you sure that this will be okay for what you want to do for the string? Uh, yes. For the amplitude of ambitons? Yes. But I will get ambiguities and I will tell you what the ambiguities are. It's a good question, and, and the, there are these ambiguities, and these ambiguities are also related to the kind of things that you can get when, when you do all these tricks, and yeah, we can talk more about that. Uh, now, we have also seen, but this will be the starting point of what we are going to do today, that the, the simplest solution was these generalized free fields, and generalized free fields you could take, it was the sum of these three terms, so you could, you could do the conformal partial wave decomposition, and we have seen that the intermediate operators were the identity operator and this tower of double trace operators with dimension 2 delta O plus 2N plus L. I am using O instead of phi, I hope that doesn't uh, perturb you too much. Note, by the way, that generalized free fields diverges as you over v to the delta phi, so that we have seen also before. And in principle, with this formula, or large spin perturbation theory, we could have fully reconstructed the whole regulate, the whole correlator from this singularity. We could have done it. We are lazy, we didn't do it, but since we can reconstruct any generator, we can also ge reconstruct generalized free fields. But notice, and this was uh, also said before, that this singularity arises by a crossing from the presence of the identity operator in the cross channel. So, if you are really smart, then just by knowing the fact that you have the identity operator in the cross channel, you know that you need to have this singularity u over v to the delta phi with a 1. Here we are just using crossing, and the 1 here. And from this, you could have constructed the full correlator of generalized free fields if you wanted to. Good. Now, the interesting part with the motivation of, of the, the beginning of the talk, we will try to compute 1 over n corrections to generalized free fields. So one idea, the, the reason to study generalized free fields, is that if you have these holographic conformal field theories at n equals infinity, that's the answer you get by cluster decomposition. And now, the idea now is that we want to compute generalized free fields plus 1 over n corrections to that. And through the DSCFT duality, this large n conformal field theory in d dimensions would correspond to some gravitational theory in one dimension more, in ADS d plus 1. And then the 1 over n square expansion in the conformal field theory, as we saw, it corresponds to some genus or loops in the theory in ADS. Is that okay? In such a way that the one corresponds to this three level diagram, to the disconnected diagrams, the sum of the three generalized three fields, one over n square will correspond to three level, one over n to the four will correspond to this. Is that okay? This Imagine that, that you have a look at the string amplitude of genus 1 and you shrink it in such a way that, that this is very thin and looks like a usual diagram in ADS. Is that okay? You could also study just gravity in ADS if you wanted to. Yes. Ah, uh, that's a very important uh, question actually. It's not that easy. I think there is a 1 over n to the 5. 
Yes, but I, I, I am sure. Well, I wrote it as uh, like this for this talk, but the the precise relation is one divided the central charge, and then this is just an expansion in inverse powers of the central charge, and the central charge for n equals four super n minus goes like n squared minus one. So really, the central charge is more natural this expansion, but I didn't want to confuse the students. Now. Um, even in the computation by Witten, where he says to compute more or less how to compute this or this, to compute loops in EDS is incredibly hard. So now, what we are going to do, we are going to use all the wisdom that we were acquiring yesterday and the day before, and we will try to solve this problem. Great. So let's start with generalized free fields, and let's put 1 over n squared corrections to generalize three fields. Now, this 1 over n squared corrections may arise from two sources. First, it could be, it is actually, that the double trace operators will acquire corrections. So now, their dimensions will not anymore be 2 delta plus 2n. There will be this plus some anomalous dimension that goes like 1 over n squared. And that will certainly happen. The same can happen with the OPE coefficients, that the OPE coefficients acquire a correction of order 1 over n squared. This also can happen. But in addition, there is a more subtle effect, and is that new intermediate operators appear at order 1 over n squared. So you have that the intermediate operators at zero order, there were just this double trace, but it could be that at order 1 over n squared, a new operator appears. And the question we are asking now, which corrections are consistent with crossing symmetry and the structure of null singularities? And it turns out this question has a unique answer. And let me give it to you. First, let's, let's have a look at whether we have exchanged operators, like new operators, at order 1 over n squared. And actually, it turns out we always do. Because in large n conformal field theories, if they are dual to a gravitational theory, they should have a stress tensor. But the stress tensor, because of world identities, there is nothing we can do about it, appears in the OPE of O with O with a coefficient that is 1 over n squared, that is 1 over the central charge. So at order 1 over n squared, you have a new operator, which is the stress tensor. Now, this stress tensor, you can ask, OK, how I am going to compute these anomalous dimensions due to the stress tensor? But that's a piece of cake for us. Because by using crossing, and now on the right-hand side, instead of having, sorry. So remember that at three level, we have GUV is equal to u over v to the delta o, and then we have the identity operator. And now, what we have is the conformal block vu of the stress tensor. So v to the. Is that OK? So because we have the stress tensor in the dual channel, because of crossing, and because we have the stress tensor, the stress tensor, the presence of the stress tensor, plus other operators, will produce a specific singularity as v goes to zero. Is that OK? So at order 1 over n squared, we have a very spe special d minus 2. Sorry. Yeah. So the twist of the stress tensor is d minus 2. So it's d minus 2 over 2. So the fact that we have the stress tensor plus, together with, crossing symmetry tell us that in addition to the 1, now at order 1 over n squared, we have this um, conformal block of the stress tensor. And that produces a very specific divergence in the null limit, a power of 1 over v. But notice that now the power is a little bit different. And also one will have a function of u 
but this is just given by the conformal block of the energy tensor, so it's very well defined. And then we have the divergence. We apply Lush spin perturbation theory or the inversion formula, and then we can compute gamma 1 and A1. Beautiful. Now, this solution, I can give it to you, is a bit ugly, but it's super uh, explicit. And this solution corresponds, from the point of view of ADS, corresponds to an exchange diagram like this, where this intermediate state is the gravity, basically. And we will call this a uh, function grab, because gravity is too long. In addition, and this is a little bit tricky, but in addition, we can have a special solutions consistent with no external divergence. This corresponds to these ambiguities that we were talking about. And these solutions, remember that we said that this gamma 1 and A1 vanish to all orders in 1 over L. But what would happen is that you could have some solution with a finite support in the spin. And this corresponds to the ambiguities that we were talking about. But from the point of view of ADS, this has actually a beautiful interpretation. And these are truncated solutions, and they correspond to local interactions in the ADS part. And again, this can be uh, classified, etc., etc. You have to say what is the, the upper limit on the spin that, that they have, and you can count these solutions, etc. So I will give you a super beautiful characterization in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, yes. I have to say local because that kind of would annoy some people well, who believe that there is a theorem that it should be non-local. I think this was a study by Polchinski and, and determined by Polchinski in 2009. No, um, for vector models, which I think your thing applies. Your, your, your discussion is general. Well, I mean, I, I am, it, so his idea mm -hmm. was to construct these truncated solutions as solutions to crossing, and, and he saw that actually these solutions, they do correspond to local interactions in the bank. Yes. And this agrees with some recent claims? I don't, well, I don't know. Look, I mean, he has a few, I tell, I tell you why he does not, because he has a few assumptions, and actually the only theory that satisfies all his assumptions is n equals 4 super units. And for any quest for super enemies, this is certainly true. Oh, okay. yeah. He doesn't say that in his paper, but that came out. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. So actually, he puts different, many assumptions. Like he uses a gap, he uses this, he uses that. And really, there are not other models except any quest for, okay. basically. Good. So we have these two kinds of solutions. So we have these exchange solutions in the bulk that we can construct in a space-time, and we have this, which we can also construct in a space-time. So now, uh, we are really, sorry, sorry what the, the, the previous one, the exchange is the dot, and the double trace? So a, every solution is a solution that gives me an anomalous dimension and correction to the OP coefficient of the double trace. But this one, in exchange solution, a double trace operators with all spin acquire a correction, but for these quartic interactions, let's say only double trace operators with the spin zero acquire a correction, or only spin zero and spin two, or spin zero two and four. So, and that's why they are truncated in the spin. There are special solutions. Uh, I, I will give the, a much better characterization of those. In, in uh, uh, anyway, we started late. <laughs> Good. So now let's go to order 1 over n to the 4. And at order 1 over n to the 4, something beautiful happens. Even if you assume that there is no new operators, at no new intermediate operators at order 1 over n to the 4, the double trace operators in the dual channel produce a divergence. And the reason why this is so is quite subtle, but the double trace operators in the dual channel will have an expansion like this. So it's u over v 
delta O. I remember here I have the same conformal block expansion, but in VU, right? But in particular, they will have V to the twist over 2. But this twist will include this 1 over n to the 4 times the anomaly of dimension, right? Which we just computed at the previous order. You go with mathem to Mathematica, you take V to the 1 over n squared gamma, you expand that in powers of n squared, of 1 over n squared, and you will see that to order 1 over n to the 4, you produce a singularity, which is not a power law, but is a log square V. So that also produces a singularity. So, we have this new singularity, which is proportional to the square of the anomalous dimension at the previous order. And again, because of our inversion formula, with that, if once we get this, we can reconstruct the full correlator at order 1 over n to the 4. And we are already 1 over n to the 4, right? Now, uh, there is a very nice picture that, that you can draw, actually, because, remember, we said that the anomalous dimension at order, at first order, at order 1 over n to the 4, to the square, was the sum of this gravitational exchange plus these truncated solutions. It means that when you square that, you will get three kinds of terms. You will get grab grab, grab trunk, and trunk trunk. Right? It's just, uh, I wanted to fit the two, but it didn't fit on the line, so <laughs> there is a two. So, but now, this leads to the following contributions. For instance, if you have an exchange with an exchange, you get this loop contribution. If you have exchange with a quartic vertex, you have something like this. And if you have this, if you have two truncated solutions, you get this. This is exactly like the unitarity method, but now for ADS amplitudes. So this is uh, a very beautiful picture. And the thing is that we are able to compute all of this. So all these diagrams, you take the gamma 1 that you have, and you are able to compute that. So this has been pretty general, the discussion. Um, but it turns out, so the equation we want to, sorry, the theory we want to deal with is n equals 4 super n mills. And it turns out that n equals 4 super n mills follows exactly in this category. And what happens for n equals 4 super n mills is that, well, at three level, you get basically generalized three fields. At 1 over n squared, you can furthermore do the 1 over lambda expansion. And uh, the exchange diagram corresponds to the gravitational, to the supergravity solution, to what people call the supergravity solution. Then the first 1 over lambda to the 3 half solution, which is the leading 1 over lambda correction to the supergravity <coughs> result, corresponds to the first truncated solution, the second corresponds to the other truncated solutions, and so on. So, in n equals 4 super n mills, the 1 over, lambda, 1 over n and 1 over lambda expansion precisely organizes between this, this, and, and this tower of truncated solutions. And according to what we have just said, we just, with this uh, machinery, we take the square of these corrections, and we can compute all these contributions. And these contributions are really 1 over n to the 4. And the, this is really, from the point of view of a string theory, is the genus 1. And these are higher alpha prime corrections. And this, we know the structure of this up to any order in 1 over lambda. We cannot fix overall coefficients, but we know the precise expression in space time. And we can compute the square for any of these contributions. Um, is that okay? Question? Yes. Um, you have the little time there. Right, so, there, there is the, so this is n equals 4 super n mills. In n equals 4 super n mills, there is, if you want to be super precise, everything is a mess because you have supersymmetry. So you have to solve super conformal world identities. So what I sold you as exchange of the stress tensor 
is the exchange of two towers of protected operators, half VPS and one quarter VPS. Yes, but sorry about that. But, it, but really, the, the physics is exactly this one. But indeed, but you have a whole tower of all protected operators that you can take into account, and they give you this supergravity solution. Uh, and here I am taking the lambda large. So it is in N equals 4 super N -Nils. If you didn't take lambda large, you could have intermediate single trace operators as well. But, and that would be a mess. But since I take in 1 over lambda corrections, we don't have that. Draw, you are drawing written diagrams. You, you, I guess, mean to include the channel diagrams. Yes, absolutely. Three of them. Yes, absolutely. And, and I have no, no way to compute only one of them. I, uh, well, they are all included? They are all included, yes. And I compute just the four point function, the full one. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's what you mean. So yes. just yeah, sorry, it's just a way of writing it. Pretty bad. But indeed, I mean, one should sum STU, so. Some good. Sorry. But can one think of the one of the lambda to the three halves as a slight fattening of the. We will come back to that later. Oh, okay. Yeah, in a way, I, this is just a representation, but in a way, if you want to think of this as alpha prime corrections, all of them should start fattening this. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yes, beautiful. And indeed, I mean, the idea is that all these alpha prime corrections will make this like a fat, uh, I don't know the shape of that. But I know that this is like a donut. Yeah. So the same here, right? So this loop diagram will get to a nice stringy donut. Good. I don't want to enter too much into the details here, uh, since I don't have a lot of time. So there is an issue with operator mixing. And actually, what happens in ADS um, in, in N equals 4 super N emails is that when you do all these diagrams, actually, although the external um, operators are, are just the operators that correspond to the graviton, inside the loop, you have the calusa claim modes as well. So you need to sum over these calusa claim modes. But that's very complicated, and I am not going to talk about this. There is a question that someone could have asked. And the very simple question is, what are you talking about? Because if you look at this, this depends on st and u, and this depends on x1, x2, x3, x4, or two cross ratios in a space time. So here, st and u are like momentum coordinates, and cross ratios are special coordinates. So if you want to be super precise, which is precise, I have learned in the Mathematical Institute that there is not a, like there are not like different levels of precision. Anyway, so if you want to be precise, uh, really what we mean by the string amplitude in LDS 5 plus S5 is like a Melin transform that is similar to a Fourier transform of the correlator. So instead of having the correlator of the cross ratios u and v, you define these many variables, s, t, and u, and then you define this transform of the, the correlator that, that uh, we, we have just quoted. I mean, this is quite beautiful. I don't have much time to review that. However, I will tell you a few beautiful things. So in this language here, so in Melina space, so this is the precise definition, in Melina space, it turns out that crossing symmetry is just a statement that M is completely symmetric, the Melin amplitude is completely symmetric under the exchange of ST and U. Beautiful. The second one, you go to the supergravity amplitude in N equals 4 super N mills. In a space time, is two pages. It's really complicated. Logs, litus, log square, U, V, is like crap. You go to this space, to this Melina space, and the supergravity amplitude is this beautiful meromorphic function. It's 1 over s minus 1, t minus 1, u minus 1. And that's the supergravity solution. There is also a beautiful way to describe all these truncated solutions. And these truncated solutions are just symmetric polynomials in the Mandelstam variables. Let's call them Mandelstam instead of Melina. S, t, and u. <laughs> 
And it's just this, and that's the characterization of in Medina space, the, the string amplitude, sorry, the supergravity amplitude is this, and the, the truncated solutions are symmetric polynomials of ST and U. And what happens, basically, so the structure is this, is that at leading order in alpha prime, you just get gravity. Then, for the first corrections, you have a polynomial of degree 0, then polynomials of degree 2, then polynomials of degree 3, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, as you increase alpha prime, the power of alpha prime, you get higher and higher polynomials. Now, one of the reasons why it is believed that what people is describing here is really the amplitude in EDS 5 plus 5 is that there is a way to take a flat space limit. If you have a look at your amplitude and you take a limit on which the radius of EDS becomes very large, so R goes to infinity, and these Mandelstam variables, ST and U, are rescaled appropriately, in particular ST and U become very large, alpha prime becomes zero, but this S alpha prime, etc., are fixed, then what happens is that when you get all these series, you should get back to the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude. Now, for cross, from, just from crossing symmetry, uh, it's not clear how to fix these coefficients. We only understand the structure. But the message is that the leading coefficient at each power of alpha prime, so here is the coefficient of sigma 2, here the coefficient of sigma 3, that will survive in the flat space, and all the other subleading terms are like curvature corrections that are there because we are in a DS5. Is that okay? Any questions? So what's the kinematic limit between S and T and U? Yeah, so, so it's like S, T and U are all large, and alpha prime is zero, but in such a way that S alpha prime is fixed. And, and so that means it, it's, it's high momentum transfer. Yeah, the I, I mean the thing is that the, what you would call the flat space momentum is like S times alpha prime. Yeah. Good. But we are not happy enough because we went to 1 over n to the 4. And now what you can do is you can take all your answers in of 1 over n to the 4 so are all these genus 1 amplitudes, right? And you can write all of these in Melina space, and what happens is quite a mess. Uh, well, it's not such a mess. But basically, what we have computed is the genus 1 a string amplitude on EDS 5 plus 5 in an alpha prime expansion. And we have the first term, the term proportional to alpha prime cube, the term proportional to alpha prime to the 5, I want to stress, we have done this just from symmetries. We have not done any diagrammatic computation, or net ES, or anything, right? And then, we have this limit, this is this monster on net ES 5 plus 5, and we take the flat space limit of it. And if you take the flat space limit of the supergravity result, you get exactly the box function in 10 dimensions which is the one-loop result for type 2B supergravity on flat space. You go to these papers of the 80s, and they compute this. It's terrible. So you may be used to the fact that the box function is easy. That's true only in four dimensions. The box function in 10 is quite complicated, and we precisely obtain that expression. And furthermore, even more beautiful, you take all our alpha prime corrections, and you take the flat space limit, and you compare that with the result, a result obtained by, by my green, Russo, and Makhov, and on the nose, we get exactly the flat space results. So for instance, at order alpha prime to the 5, there is this coefficient 87, s to the 6 plus s to the 40 minus u squared, log s. You see how complicated the results are. We precisely obtain these results. Uh, in flat space. But what we have is much more than that. It's the string amplitude on a DS5 plus a 5. And in a particular limit, we recover the flat space limit, what they have. 
function. In this box function, I mean, you have all the fields of type to be propagated. Yeah, like yeah. The, yeah. The fermions, everything. Like yeah. Get yeah, it's type to be super grand. Yeah, that was quite cool. So, and it's complete. Good. So this is my last uh, my last um, slide. So we have seen in these lectures that one can develop an efficient machinery to study one over n corrections to holographic correlators. We have actually chosen this specific case because it's the most interesting. But you can do things in two dimensions, in four dimensions. Um, we have also provided the first genus one computation of a string theory amplitude in curved space time. And now we can answer a lot of detailed questions. So for instance, you know that supergravity is UV divergent. And from our results, UV divergences is something that we can study very well. And uh, I can tell you more about that, but uh, it's a bit technical. And hopefully now we can start asking quantitative questions about quantum gravity or string theory in curved space. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it does. How, I, how far can you push this? <laughs> yeah, actually, there are pieces that you can compute, I guess, to genus 2 uh, and higher. Um, the one problem is that at some point, uh, and I think we are very near that point, also triple trace operators may start contributing. So you have this triple trace, and then you have to solve the mixing problem with this triple trace. Uh, so I think like the full answer to genus 2 would be very hard to get. Uh, yeah, but not impossible. But, but maybe, I think the, the previous problem, so basically this is the genus 1 solution for the correlator O2, 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 O2. Probably one first needs to understand the full genus 1 solution for like OP, OP, like more general things. And that can be used to solve this mixing problem, and then we can go to genus two. And yeah, apparently, like in genus three, people doesn't know what to do, even in flat space. So they like no proposal. There are some words by Mafra at all, uh, but it's quite hard actually. It's even to write something down, it's, it's like extremely complicated. Yes. I'm sorry, I mean, you, you. You're getting a simple answer only by summing over all channels. Uh, or, or no, no, this. Can you isolate a specific sorry, channel? Sorry, so this, the pictures yeah. are, were just pictures. He never has channels. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't use channels. Yeah, I, don't, I don't use channels. No. Right. So I just compute no, 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 the no, CFT no. data. But, but if I wanted to compare this to a string theory calculation, I would have to calculate each channel, add them up, and then I would get maybe a mess. Oh, well, in a string theory, there is no channels either. Because well, in a string theory, you have a torus. And you put four insertions, and that's what you compute, right? No, but I mean, I, I mean, if you start from the semi-classical calculation, I mean, you start with some gravitational yeah, things, and then you add them up, and then you no, 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 why would you? There are no that? channels. Yeah, there are no channels, right? You have a torus and you have four. Yeah, okay. But that's the pure calculation. Yeah, the yeah, flat channels. Yeah, it's impossible to use. Yeah, exactly. Like a string field theory. Yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. No, but in the computation of of, of uh, Green and Russo and Markov, you so just have a torus. Yeah, it's a worship, honest worship calculation. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating that n equals four tells you so much about even things in flat space. Right. Yeah. Like these are really detailed questions about and one over n to the four. Yes, sir. So again, these operators are protected these two. Can you extract from the amplitude the operator and the original yeah, I mean the stress tensor. So in n equals four super animals, it is a bit um, it's a bit trivial because the the stress tensor corresponds. So it is a protected super multiplet, and that has a contribution that is taken into account. So the mean polarization tensor. That, yeah, that's also true. Absolutely. So uh, yes. So in n equals four super animals, to to be able to compute all the polarizations, etc. One would need to compute like OP1, OP2, OP3, OP4. And what happens is that in 10 dimensions you have only one graviton, and when you do the Calusa Klein reduction of that, you have all these towers of things in, in LDS. 
that we haven't done. Uh, and that's the reason why we get something so clean. Yeah. However, sorry, however, in, in flat space, and I don't know if the same is here, all the polarizations go together in what is called R to the 4. So you have something that you compute times R to the 4, and this R to the 4 is, is a function of all the polarizations and everything. So all the polarizations are together in this R to the 4 term. In the old days, yes. uh, people were having trouble matching scaling amplitudes to stuff because they needed some sort of wave function to connect the point of interaction to the outside. Yes, and here I you have this inversion formula. Is there a clean wave function that one sees there, or does one need to write it in a, in a yeah, I don't know. presentation with more junk? I think, in a way, I, when we say this already, so when we say that the string amplitude is exactly this. One is chose is choosing some kind of wave functions, and in the original words of Polchinski, Benedones, etc., they are choosing some wave function, and we are using their wave function, and in a way this is a test that it seems to work also to order one over n to the four, but we, we are using they have used a wave function already, okay. and that's and, and the wave function is hidden. It's not hidden, but it's basically in this when you made that proposal. You are saying how you, you go from a representation of position to a representation in which you have momentum. Yeah, uh, absolutely, you're right. But it's somehow in that. Yes. You have certain ambiguities. Yes. The I can talk a lot about. Space? No. Let, uh, yes. <coughs> no. No. <laughs> so so let, let me. Do I have two minutes to talk about ambiguities? This is really good. If, imagine that. Um, I was a little cavalier, more than once, although you didn't notice, you may have not noticed. But when you compute this Mellin amplitude, the kind of way of computing this Mellin amplitude, you get sums. So you get this kind of sums, and people see better here, right? So you have like M of, let's say, this Mandelstam variable S, and the kind of sums that you get is sum over N from 2 to infinity of 1 over s minus 2n. That's the sum we get, the kind of sums. Now, of course, this sum is a divergent sum. And you need to do something to regularize this sum. You could do different things. Something that you could do is you take derivative of this with respect to s. If you take a derivative with respect to s, here, you will have a square. If you have a square, the sum is now convergent. This sum is called the d gamma function of 2 minus s over 2, I am told. And now, once you do this, you can integrate. And then you say that m of s is equal to basically psi 1 of 2 minus s over 2. However, I was too quick. Because when you integrate, you could get a constant of integration. And, and no one tells you that this constant of integration has to be finite. This constant of integration is very large. So by this procedure, what I have managed to do I have managed to solve my sum to sum a divergent sum, but at the expense of having a constant of integration. Now, notice that in Medina space, this constant of integration has exactly the same form as the oh, okay. yes, has exactly the same form as a constant here, right? But this, you can see that it corresponds to a r to the 4, which is exactly the same counter term that you add to make the computation in supergravity finite. So by looking at the sums and looking at the ambiguities, you recover exactly which counter terms you can add at each order, and they exactly agree with the counter terms in the UV. Yeah, that you this way. That's the answer you put. Any last questions? Uh, 
quite a few excellent ones. Um, so thank you for the